mean, would you be would you be open to developing? I know Stanley was trying to work with Gotham uh, Comics in India to develop characters, but why hasn't that gone further in that being more inclusive of Asian superheroes? Well, well I'm, I'm from the Philippines, and that's actually happening now in, in the Philippines. Um, one thing that one thing that we learned very early on um, uh, uh, when we're doing comics. And, and like when I started teaching, and I'm pretty sure you too, one of the very first things I say is this is a job. Okay, so the industry, it's business. You know, like like right now, there is uh, this year, uh, last October, I did a cover for Marvel um, uh, called, uh, um, uh, there's a new Asian group there. The leader is, uh, uh, I believe, Chinese. Yeah, Arrow, and, right? Arrow. Arrow. And um, they introduced a Filipino character, uh, Wave. Wave, yeah. And uh, I think Greg Pak is half Korean. And I just met Alisa Wong, she's Pinay, she's Filipino. And Simi Sabolski is the editor-in-chief. And he just loves uh, Asia. In fact, he was the Asia head for Marvel for years over here. So my point there is, this is a business. So the Philippines, through our artists from the decades, we've had migrations of Filipino artists into comics, American comics, since the 60s. And then, because of the, um, the big growth in comics as a business in Manila, right? like right now, this year, uh, I think there's four variant covers done by stores over there. So if you don't know what a variant cover is, a retailer can buy 3,000 to 5,000 copies of any comic book, and then Marvel Entertainment will get Adam or I to do an extra cover for that. So those 3,000 to 5,000 copies are extremely rare because those are the only copies that will have our covers on it. And those will only be able to be sold at that at that dealer, at that person's place. So those four covers can, and only can get exclusively, you can only get them in Manila. Okay, so now what that means is that Manila, but in the Philippines in general, have shown through sheer power, buying power, and enthusiasm power um, as fans, that they need that done. You gotta remember, well, I think Marvel last count, what is it, 5,000 character count? You know, so adding another character, you got to make sure you know. And, and I know this from way back. When when I started on Uncanny X Men, they said you need another guy on your team, so you need to create a new X Men. So I created Bishop. Well, a lot of people over here probably don't know this, but my original intent was to say, can he be a Filipino character? Can Bishop be Filipino? But see, this is how it goes. I was in California. I made the phone call to Bob Harris in New York pitched him the character for Bishop, and then he said, yes, approved. And before I could ask if he could be a Filipino, he said, so many um, kids from the Black Committee have been writing in for all the years, and they would like a new character. Does it fit that your character is Black? And I said, no problem. Even though I wanted him to be Filipino, I said, no problem. Because at that point when I created Bishop, there wasn't as big of an uproar in the Asian community, specifically the Philippines at the time. So, you that, in, like in any industry, if you could prove that you could do the work, if you could prove that you could do the job work well, if you could prove that, um, uh, like this is a fan-based uh, industry, you guys, if you could prove that the fans like you, then that, that's all the power you need. In fact, that's how we started Image. Um, we were all top, all seven of us were top artists um, in the industry. You really shook up the, the industry at that time, right? Yeah, and you so quick right there. we all left together, we brought all of our fans together, you guys, and you guys gave us the power to be able to do that. If we didn't have you guys, you guys as fans, then we wouldn't have been able to do it, and you guys wouldn't know what Image is today. But because of you guys, you, you, you guys we were able to do that. And so very early on in our careers, all seven of us decided, well, understood, um, you, you, you know, we need to be able to do our jobs and do our jobs well. And what well meant was, 
you guys like our work. But I think you mentioned um, because you guys work. I mean, one of the main reasons that all seven of us connected with you guys so so easily was that we're we're, we're like you guys. So when you guys wanted the animations and everything, we wanted them too. And so by the mid '90s, I wanted to start exploring all that other stuff too with you guys. And so um, I actually went back to the Philippines in the mid '90s um, for an extended vacation. I thought maybe I'd stay there for two months. I, I ended up staying there for five years. And the reason was that when I got there, there were all these young indie talents. And they were all begging me to train them, begging me to help them. I originally, I was in vacation mode. I, I, I wanted to relax for a little bit after working so hard every day. But they pulled me in. And so that's when I, I set up a studio um, on Bolete Drive. For people who, who aren't Filipino, Balete Drive is the street where all these big mansions are, and that's where the white lady walks. So if you're ever driving there late at night, don't look in the back seat of your car because she will be there, sitting there with, um, uh, grinning at you. That's an ass Lord. <laughs> but, um, so I set up a studio there and I discovered people like Lemiel Yu and Jerry Allen Gillan, uh, and JL Necleto. Um, and, and a lot of other, a lot of other people, um, and I discovered that I actually, I actually really liked it. I actually really enjoyed finding talent and and to helping them develop. Um, after after working as a profession for a long time. You're able to look at other artists' work, and you can you can see how they're developing and where they're developing. Uh, the problem that a lot of young aspiring artists have is that you don't know those things. You're just drawing and drawing, and, and you're just being frustrated because you can't draw what you're seeing in your head. And so, a lot of times, if you're lucky, it takes a working professional to be able to look at your work and say, hey, your eyes are really good. Hey, your anatomy is really good. Or your anatomy is, is good and it's just about there. You just need to work on this bit. You know, uh, everybody, as an, when you're starting out as an artist, you're always down on yourself. You're always going, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Yes, you have to concentrate on what you can't do and develop that to the point that you can't do it. But you can't, nobody can work in just depression, depression mode, you know? And, and, and so you need to know what, equal to not knowing what, not equal to knowing what you're bad at. Equal importance is knowing what you're good at. Because if your eyes and hairs and, and your face is perfect and it's really good, now, you don't have to concentrate on that anymore. Thank you.